Welcome to Photos and Travel, a show that introduces you to fascinating places around the world. Please welcome our host and tour guide, Jonathan Van Bilsen. If you close your eyes and picture the most remote place on Earth, you'll no doubt envision the small Chilean landmass of Rapa Nui, known to most of us as Easter Island. A mere six hours of flying from Chile's capital of Santiago puts you smack in the middle of the South Pacific. Easter Island is in fact 4,000 kilometers from the coast of Chile and the same distance from the shores of Tahiti. We'll explore this strange remote land right after these messages. Thinking of indoor or outdoor signs? At PP Print, we can help with so much to offer. Just ask. We've got you covered. PP Print, where experience pays off. Pet Value has a fleet of services to help you and your pet live your very best lives. Visit Pet Value Port Perry for all of your pet's needs. Pet Value, your pet, your store. The most well-known and probably the only identifying symbol of the island are the famous statues or moai, as they are known. Today we're going to explore the truth behind the statues. Their interesting history, contrary to popular opinion, does not lie in magical myth. To truly experience the splendor of the island, one must first realize the history. Easter Island is one of the most isolated islands in the world, but 1200 years ago, a double-hulled canoe filled with seafarers from a distant culture landed upon its shores. A band of Maori warriors, part of the Polynesian tribes of the South Pacific, accidentally stumbled onto the island. Over the centuries that followed, a remarkable society developed in isolation. As with any culture, rituals soon developed. For reasons still unknown today, in an effort to immortalize their leaders, men began cutting huge stone images in the likeness of their chiefs of the tribes. These monuments, or moai, are among the most incredible ancient relics ever discovered. Easter Island is a tiny speck of land in the South Pacific. Formed by a series of massive volcanic eruptions, the island was only inhabited by seabirds and dragonflies for millions of years. Its steep slopes, however, stood out like a beacon to a weary group of Polynesian seafarers. How long their voyage took or the reasons for leaving their home country are questions we'll never have an answer to but we can imagine their joy at seeing this sight after what must have been months at sea. Lava tubes and pounding waves have created hundreds of sea caves and a treacherous coastline. There are only a few small areas that are safe for anchorages. Volcanic cones are found at each point of the island. The largest, Ranukau, is easily visible from space. The highest is Teravaca, which rises to 3,558 meters above sea level. There are over 70 eruptive centers on the island, but none has known activity since the island was colonized 1,300 years ago. It is at the sheltered beach of Anakina that the legends say Hotomutua landed and begun the colonization of the island. Excavations of this area have discovered it was one of the most important sites and boasts one of the best collections of erected moai on the island. The voyagers started constructing villages and houses made from an unusual elliptical shape. It has been speculated that this style of construction started when the new arrivals turned their boats upside down for quick housing. There were literally hundreds of remains of these foundations on the island in the 1800s, but most were destroyed by the missionaries to make fences. The caldera of Ranokau stretches 1.6 kilometers or one mile across. It is from the slopes of this great crater many of the famous statues were carved. It took a team of 30 men nearly two years to carve one moai. The ritual was commissioned by the chief of each tribe during their reign. At the same time, a second team of men dug a large hole at the base of the crater. When the carving was complete, 
The back of the statue was chipped loose, allowing it to slide down the mountainside into the hole. It stood there upright until the death of the village chief, which in some cases was many years later. Some of the statues visible today remain lodged in the ground as their ritual ceased prior to the death of the chiefs. On average, each statue stands 4 meters or 13 feet high and weighs about 14 tons. Those still buried in the ground have nearly two-thirds of their mass still hidden in the earth. It is unclear why the Easter Islanders turned to statue construction on such a massive scale. Their obsession with this ultimately brought about their downfall as they depleted more and more of the forest for use in the process of moving the giant moai. While the why is a mystery, where it happened and to a large degree how it happened is fairly clear. Many of the Moai were born from the massive caldera of Ranu Rakau. The soft volcanic tuff was perfect material for statue carving. Using harder volcanic rock implements, they were able to first sketch out the Moai's outline in the rock wall and then systematically chip away at it until the Moai was held in place by a thin keel. Moai carvers were master craftsmen that rose through the ranks of a carver's guild. The production of the statues was most likely through conscripted labor with many rituals and ceremonies being performed throughout the process. The stone carvers were ingenious in making the most out of the sections of rock. Moai can be seen carved in all directions in the cliff. If a defect would appear in the rock, the statue would be abandoned and they moved on to another area. They took advantage of the fissures in the volcanic walls and also variations in color. In short, they were true artists. Finally, when the statue was finished, the keel was broken and slid carefully down the slope using ropes tied to giant palm trunks which were sunk in specially prepared holes in the rim of the crater. At the base of the crater, they were raised up and finally decorations were carved onto its torso and back. On the island's western shore lies the ruins of a very unique ahu. Unique because all the statues of this site are very different from each other. Coral and obsidian eyes were placed in as a final touch, although some suggest these were only added in the statues on special occasions. Preparation was then made for transport across the island to the various ahu, which are platforms made from lava stones measuring anywhere from 30 to 100 meters or 60 to 300 feet long and at least 10 meters or 30 feet high. The ahu were the ceremonial platforms built to support collections of moai. As evidence of the difficulty of moving the Moai, many broken pieces can be seen along the paths of ancient roadways where they broke along the way and then were abandoned. Once the statues were reasonably complete, they had to be transported across the island to platforms prepared for them. In some cases, this involved a trek of 20 kilometers or 12 miles. How were these massive Moai moved to the sites? Well, barring any extraterrestrial influence, it seemed likely they were rolled along the ancient roads that crisscrossed the island on logs, lubricated with the oils from palm trees. Some suggest they were moved in an upright position and kept stable by crews manning ropes. This mode would verify the island legends of the statues walking to their sites. From a distance, seeing one of these great moai moving along the road, bobbing up and down as the logs moved underneath, would surely have looked like a statue moving under its own power with a procession alongside it. What a sight that would have been. However, recent computer simulations have shown that it would have been much simpler to position the moai in a horizontal position on two large logs and then roll the entire unit along the logs placed perpendicular to it. 
Using this method, an average moai could have been moved from the quarry to Ahuakivi in less than five days, using approximately 70 men. Keep in mind, the statues were up to 11 meters in height, or 36 feet, and weighed as much as 80 tons. Eventually, the statues arrived at the Ahu or altar. Stones were placed underneath and the logs, mostly ruined by this time, were cast away. More stones were added until the moai at last rested the same height as the Ahu. The head was raised a few centimeters using the brute strength of the tribesmen and stones were placed under it. This continued until at last, in some cases several years, the statue stood upright. This is the site at Ahuakivi and dates back to 1460. It is one of the largest constructions built, probably at a time when the statue cult was beginning to unravel. Using more logs, the statue was then rolled onto the Ahu to stand in its final resting place. Some platforms held as many as 15 moai, with all but one facing inward to watch over the tribe. One was always placed facing the sea, watching and ready to warn of approaching dangers. The first islanders found a lush island filled with giant palms which they used to build boats and housing. The plants they brought with them did well in the rich volcanic soil, and by 1550 the population on the island was between 7,000 and 9,000. Distinct clans formed as the population increased and various population centers grew in different areas of the island. One thing tied them all together, the statue construction and the cult that formed around it. The stonework of Ahu Vaiuri on the southern shore of the island shows the incredible precision in the stone fittings. It was this precision, so similar to the stonework done by the Incas, that gave Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl the idea that the Easter Islanders had come from South America in reed boats on the prevailing currents. Stonework of this complexity had not been seen in Polynesia, but it was quite common in Peru. It is impossible to look at that site and not think of the exact type of stone fitting which is so common in sites like Machu Picchu. Most archaeologists consider the similarities a coincidence. If that is the case, it certainly is a remarkable one. Soon, erected moais were installed in all corners of the island, until over 1,000 had been carved. For decades, the competition to build the biggest and the best moai went on. Different Ahu, each belonging to a different clan, formed an almost unbroken line along the coast of Easter Island. The culture had reached its zenith, and then something went terribly wrong. A chilling story of resource exploitation and destruction on Easter Island was beginning to come to light. After the break, we'll take a look at how the culture of Easter Island dwindled and almost disappeared and we'll see startling similarities to our own mistreatment of the planet. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Terry Voss from Voss Your Internet Brochure. It's been a year since the pandemic started. I want to take this opportunity to sincerely thank all of our customers for their understanding, their loyalty, and their friendliness. I will admit it's been a trying time, but we have come this far only because of you, our valued friends. Welcome back. The culture of Easter Island began to change in an altogether different direction. The discovery of the island by Europeans certainly had a lasting effect, and not necessarily a positive one. The first Westerners to discover the island wondered how anyone could have survived on such a desolate, treeless place. Indeed, this was a mystery until recent core samples taken from the crater showed that the island was heavily forested with a giant, now extinct palm while the Easter Island culture was active. Apparently, the islanders were greeted with a lush tropical paradise when it was first discovered. 
the resources must have seemed inexhaustible. The trees were cut for lumber, housing, wood for fires, and eventually for the rollers and lever-like devices used to move and erect the moai. As the deforestation continued, the moai building competition turned into an obsession. The quarry was producing moai at sizes that probably could never have been moved very far. One unfinished moai in the quarry is 20 meters or 70 feet tall, and still the trees came down. With the loss of the forest, the land began to erode. The small amount of topsoil quickly washed into the sea. The crops began to fail and the clans turned against one another in a battle for the scarce resources. Fierce battles began between the tribes. The symbols of the islanders' power and success, the Moai, were toppled. Eyes were smashed out and often rocks were placed where the statue's neck would fall so it would decapitate the Moai. The violence increased and it was said that the victors would eat their dead enemies to gain strength. Bones found in caves on the island show evidence of this cannibalism. With the scarce food supplies, it may have been a question of hunger as well as being ceremonial. Inside an eerie cave at the southwest corner of the island are pictographs painted in ochre and white of ghost-like birds flying upwards. With no wood left to build boats, all the Rapa Nui people could do was look enviously at the birds that sailed effortlessly through the sky. The Rapa Nui culture and community, which had developed over the past 300 years, collapsed. Their island was in shambles, and their villages and crops destroyed. There was no wood left on the island to build escape boats. A few survivors of the conflict, perhaps numbering as low as 750, began to pick up the pieces of their culture. One thing they left behind, however, were the Moai. Here we see Ahu Tongariki, sitting stately with the backdrop of the cliffs from the volcano Moanga Poiki. The Easter Islanders were more distant from the world than ever before. Any dreams of escaping the destroyed island were dashed by the lack of wood. The only boats they could build were small rafts and canoes made of tortoro reeds. Even fishing must have become extremely difficult at this point. The island was a wasteland, the eroded soil just barely producing enough food for the meager population to survive. It was under these conditions that the Birdman cult began. The small island of Motanui, off the coast of Easter Island, was home to a rare bird, the Suti Tern. A great discovery led to the start of a new cult. Motonui is a small uninhabited island 300 meters off the southwest coast of Easter Island. The inhabitants were enchanted when they discovered each bird would lay only one egg once a year. The egg-laying day became sacred to the inhabitants. Once a year, each tribe sent swimmers out to gather and return as many eggs as possible. It is possible that the birdman practices had been going on during the reign of the statue cult. However, it eventually took over as the predominant religion of the island. High on the rim of the crater, known as Ranu Kau, was the ceremonial village of Orongo, built to worship the god of fertility, Maki Maki. It became the site of a grueling competition. Each year, leadership of the island was determined by the individual who could scale down the vertical slopes, swim out to one of the three islands in shark-infested waters, and bring back the most unbroken eggs of the nesting sooty tern. The one who did this successfully was considered the Birdman of the Year and was bestowed with special honors and privileges. Small round stone huts were built in the side of the slope near the water's edge as a safe haven for the swimmers the night before their trek. 
fights broke out which led to uprisings and heavy guarding of the swimmers. The entrances to the huts were barricaded with stones and became so small that only one person could crawl through at a time, minimizing an assassin's ability to strike. Over 480 Birdman petroglyphs have been found on the island, mostly around Orongo. As Birdman images transformed the rocks, so too were the islanders transformed. It seemed that the culture was beginning to rebuild itself. In 1722, on Easter Sunday no less, the island was discovered by Dutch explorer Jacob Roggeveen, who gave the island its current name. Along with European exploration came fatal disease inflicting the people of Rapa Nui. The population soon began to dwindle to about 400. Spanish missionaries with the help of a few hundred soldiers took up the challenge and in an attempt to bring Christianity abolished the egg gathering rituals. Oddly enough, for reasons unknown, a small segment of the ritual remained and the practice of hiding and seeking eggs at Easter has become embedded into modern day customs. The missionaries arrived on Easter Island when the people were at their most vulnerable. With their society in ruins, it did not take long to convert their population to Christianity. The first change was the islander's style of dress, or lack thereof. Tattooing and use of body paint were banned. Destruction of Rapa Nui artwork, buildings and sacred objects including most of the Rongo Rongo tablets, the key to understanding their history, was swift and complete. The islanders were forced off their ancestral lands and required to live in one small section of the island while the rest of the land was used for ranching. Eventually, all pure Rapa Nui blood died out. Annexation with Chile brought new influences and today there are only a few individuals left with ties to the original population. One of the customs of the Rapa Nui people was to wear a topknot in their hair. This has been the case dating back to the original settlements and is easily visible in the creation of the statues, many of which had top knots placed on top made from different reddish stones. Hangaroa is the main town, harbor and seat of Easter Island, a municipality of Chile. It is located in the southern part of the island's west coast. It is really the only place for tourists and visitors to stay, as much of the island is still without electricity. Today the population of Hangaroa is 3300, which is about half the population of the entire island. Chile annexed Easter Island in 1888 and immediately confined all the residents to the town of Hangaroa. The rest of the island was rented to Scottish sheep farmers who stayed until 1953. The island was then managed by the Chilean Navy until 1966, at which point it was reopened in its entirety. That same year the Rapa Nui people were colonized and given Chilean citizenship. The name Rapa Nui comes from the slave era and refers to another island called Rapa, which has a similar shape. The Polynesians call their island home the navel of the world, and it is roughly centered between Chile, Tahiti, the Galapagos and Antarctica. Among all the things unique to Easter Island, the magnetic orb certainly stands out. It is said this rock, almost spherical and smooth, concentrates a magnetic and supernatural energy called mana. Because of its high iron content, the stone warms up more than others and causes the compass to behave strangely. Many visitors put their hands on it to capture the energy. Where it came from, no one knows. The Easter Island story is a story for our times. We too are on an island floating on an endless sea. 
There are differences, of course, and it could be said that because Easter Island is tiny, it was only a matter of time before the resources in such a closed system were depleted. There are parallels, however, between the islanders' attitude toward their environment as well as our own, and this is the most frightening part of the entire story. On an island as small as Easter Island, it was easy to see the effects of the deforestation as it was taking place. But the inhabitants continued their destructive actions. They probably prayed to their gods to replenish the land so they could continue to destroy it. But the gods did not answer, and the trees came down. Whatever one did to alter that ecosystem, the results were reasonably predictable. One could stand on the summit and see almost every point on the island. The person who felled the last tree could see that it was the last tree. Nonetheless, the tree was still felled. As our own forests fall to the bulldozers, there are many who are valiantly trying to save them. It is obvious now that we have satellites showing us the massive deforestation that there is a serious problem. And yet our leaders, and even the majority of individuals, look on unconcerned. They appear willing to bulldoze the last trees to build the Moai of our time, technology and development. Will we have the sense to reconcile our lifestyles with the well-being of our environment? Or is the human personality always the same as that of the person who felled the last tree on Easter Island? Of the 1,000 Moai that were sculpted, only a handful remain intact. Of those that remained into the 19th century, most were demolished during the Great Tsunami of 1964. Thankfully, governments of the world are gathering together in an effort to preserve the heritage and symbolism of the island. Japan alone has donated 8 million US dollars for the restoration of one Ahu. Other countries have taken up the challenge as well. Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark are now actively involved in the restoration. In fact, more than 100 countries are leading the charge to bring this peaceful island back to the spectacle it once was. Visiting Easter Island was one of the most incredible trips I've ever taken. I was so taken by the story I decided to write it into a book, Easter Island The Truth Behind the Statues, and it's now available on Amazon. Visiting Easter Island is not for everyone, and cruising is difficult as there are no natural beaches for ships to dock. For the true adventurer, however, it is a destination not to be missed. For Photos and Travel, I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen. It's been my pleasure to be your tour guide today, and I look forward to seeing you next time. If you enjoyed this program, please click the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. Want to know what's happening in Skugog? News and lifestyle, changes in business, and all the entertainment information you'll ever need. Plus, each edition has a new Photos and Travel article. Look for your next copy in your mailbox. At the standardnewspaper.ca, we try to show you the lighter side of our community workers and shed some light into their work in our community. With human interest stories on how the community gives back and reporting on legislation which affect us all, the Standard News is raising the standard in your community.